every aspect of our lives have changed what we knew our lives to be a year ago is perhaps absolutely different to what we know that today. Professor Salim Abdul Karim, epidemiologist and infectious disease specialist is on the show to discuss many facets of the disease. I also get his opinion and thoughts on where we're at at the moment. Prof, welcome to the show. Nice having you finally on the show to discuss very pertinent issues happening right now. It's a great pleasure and wonderful to be on the show. I know that epidemiologist, infectious disease specialist, I'm going to just want to go a little bit into your background in life because I think people need to understand uh, your what you've gone through to get to the point that you have today, uh, whether that's linked to Bill Gates or not, I'm not sure, but we will discuss that a bit later. But many, you, you've picked up many colleagues in the last couple of months. Uh, Facebook is qualifying people as epidemiologists and infectious disease specialists by the minute. I never knew there were so many of you <laughs> until, until this all started. Professor Abdul Karim, I just want to understand who you are and where it all started. Sure. I was uh, you know, born in Durban and went to school in the city center. And at the age of 10, we were moved uh, under the Group Areas Act. We used to live in Lawn Street and we were moved to a new township at the time called Chatsworth. And that's where I grew up. I went to high school in, uh, in, in the Durban city center, a school called Gandhi Desai, and then I went to medical school. Um, after medical school, I specialized, you know, I did my training in virology and uh, then decided to switch to public health. Went off to the US, studied in New York, then went to the UK, to study health economics at the London School of Economics and London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. And then when I came back to South Africa, I specialized again and did my PhD and joined the Medical Research Council where I spent many years before I came back to the university and uh, took up the position in 2001 of Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research where I've been for, you know, many years and then changed to pro vice chancellor when i retired five years ago i know that you've been in virology epidemiology or studying viruses for 38 39 years and that's a very long time that's a very long time to be i, I, I it's certainly longer than the people on facebook at the moment <laughs> it's very longer than them so right now we're in a very strange space in the world we are being bombarded with information from all kinds of sources um, and most of them perhaps not authentic. The public is confused, lots of miscommunication, lots of chaos and pandemonium in the public based on misinformation. And therefore I obviously decided to speak to you. I want to start off with something just slightly more contentious, just what I picked up happening again in the media in the last couple of days and that was Dr. Yako Lobsha and him on his, on his theory that COVID-19 or coronavirus is a vascular uh, disease instead of a respiratory disease. And so I'm trying to understand that, if you can shed some light on that, and his method to letting out that information. Perhaps before I do that, I should just make one comment on your first part of what you said, which is, uh, you know, in terms of... Uh, uh, credentials in infectious diseases. I, you know, besides the fact that I direct the Center for the Epidemiology for AIDS Research in South Africa, I hold a professorship at Columbia University in global health. I'm a professor of medicine at Cornell University in New York, and I'm a professor of immunology and infectious diseases at Harvard University. Um, I chair the advisory committee of the World Health Organization on HIV. I chair the United Nations AIDS program scientific expert panel on HIV. So, you know, I, I provide advice in many different quarters because that's what I see my role. My role is about 
making information and experience that have been gathered over almost 40 years since I did my first study on a measles outbreak in KwaZulu-Natal. And uh, it's something I do with great pleasure. When I first saw the YouTube post from Dr. Yahoo Laucha, I, I, mean, I don't know the person, I, I was a bit taken aback. I said, maybe he was having a nap when the rest of the world figured out that actually there is a stage of this disease that becomes systemic. And the way it becomes systemic is on an immunological basis. And that as part of that, we have this vasculitis or an coagulation problem that occurs. And it was described very well some time ago by the Italians. When they described the cases of stroke, they also described uh, the coagulopathy in children. So we've actually known that this can progress in a small proportion of patients, but it can progress into a systemic illness. And when it does so, it leads to a clotting disorder. And in fact, it is standard practice pretty much all over the world, that when a patient comes in with COVID-19, we put the patient onto heparin. Heparin is uh, something that reduces the risk of clots. An anticoagulant then? It's an anticoagulant. Well, yeah, it's an anticoagulant. And in, in South Africa, we tend to use heparin or low molecular weight heparin. It doesn't matter too much, but they both have the net effect that they prevent clots. When I listened to what that, that YouTube video said, uh, whoa, this is, uh, this is very, you know, I mean, this is really something that is out of the ordinary to propose using so many drugs that are, that are anticoagulants at the same time. I listened to that, I said, that's dangerous. Uh, it's dangerous because you're gonna bleed. Imagine if, you, if your patient starts bleeding, you will have no way to stop it. And you run a very high risk of stroke uh, if you put patients on that kind of anticoagulation. Uh, so I was a bit taken aback that that was being proposed, especially because there's no evidence. You can't, you can't go on, television, on, a, on a YouTube and tell me, you know, I've treated 20 patients and so they're all fine and so this is brilliant. You can't say that. We don't work like that in science and he should know that. Right? We do randomized controlled trials. We give 10 patients one medication, we give 10 patients another medication, and we compare them and we see how they do. That's the, that's the benchmark of how we decide whether something is better than something else. So, and he should know that. Why didn't he do a study? Why didn't he write it up like how the rest of us do that? Anyway, so uh, while I was watching that, my uh, WhatsApp messages started coming in and emails from all the different societies. The Infectious Diseases Society put something out you know, just basically challenging this and saying, you know, this is positively dangerous and others started doing the same. And I think it was a matter that was quickly resolved in that we all recognized what was being proposed was not a good idea. But Prof, you see, this is the issue that I started off with when I said that uh, there's lots of confusion and now one doesn't only find the confusion coming from the public that is not uh, lettered in what you do, but they, but it also at times comes from the fraternity itself, where, where individuals just decide to shoot off and put out information, and then they develop a following behind them, and that starts a new political party within the medical world, <laughs> and the confusion continues. So, uh, on your side, when I announced that I'm going to have you on the program, I had a couple of people attacking me, asking me, so are you going to uh, you know that he's involved with Bill Gates. And I said, I'm not sure he uses Apple, so I know he doesn't even use Windows for starters, but I'm not sure what the link is. How, uh, how, do, you, uh, how do you respond to that? How do you respond to that? Because I'm certain you're hearing this all the time. 
So I advise many, many organizations and individuals. One of them uh, is uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I have been in a, on the scientific advisory committee for over a decade, I think. And, uh, you know, we meet once or twice a year and we review the overall strategy of where the world is going and what, you know, what new technologies are needed, focusing largely on, you know, new preventions and new uh, treatments. Uh, if that's a problem, then it's a problem I'm happy to have mm -hmm. because I take the view that our goal must be to save lives. If developing new vaccines, new treatments saves lives, yes, I'm guilty. I want to be part and parcel of that process. And whether it's Mr. Gates or whether it's somebody else, that's irrelevant to me. It's who's willing to do the important things to get us to that point. I want to leave that matter there on, on, one, on one point, and that is that I've asked you the question as people wanted, and so I've done that. You've provided an answer for that. However, I have asked the accusers in this case. <laughs> I sound like a magistrate at the, at the moment. I've asked the accusers to provide their evidence to me in writing. And to date, nobody that is shouting blue murder has provided the evidence. So if they provide the evidence, I'll invite you back for the second sitting, but we'll, we'll adjourn on that matter for now, if I can, can leave it. So I want to um, go into a couple of very basic things and, and maybe one of the more, uh, more complex things for the public right now, apart from the minister that um, had said that flying around in an aircraft will solve the problem. I've got my theory around that also. I'm going to ask you about that. But dexamethasone. Dexamethasone, the term is coming up in the media space. People are starting to talk about this. Uh, what's your thoughts around that? And what is dexamethasone? We now have a much clearer understanding that when you acquire this virus, the SARS coronavirus 2, that initially it attacks and grows in the cells of the nose and the back of the throat. When it does that, it causes a bit of fever, a bit of cough, sore throat. And in most patients, they will then recover. They will have none, it's not really any serious condition for them. But in a fraction of those patients, they will have a situation where the virus progresses from the nose and throat into the lungs. When it gets into the lungs, it then starts infecting the individual cells in the sacs of the lungs. And those sacs are where your air goes in, and so they expand. The oxygen from the air then goes into the blood. So when these cells uh, are infected with the virus in the lungs, those cells start dying. And in a proportion of patients, they develop a very severe immune response. It's a bit of an overreaction from the, from the body side. We don't understand why that happens yet, but it's described as a cytokine storm. It's the equivalent of you know, somebody calling in the army, the navy, the air force, every part of your defense is mobilized. And when that happens, the, the defenses come to try and protect the lungs from this virus. And when that happens, you get pus filling up in the lungs. When that happens, you have difficulty breathing and you have a problem, it's not difficulty breathing, you have a problem that the oxygenation, the oxygen that you're breathing, that it doesn't go into the bloodstream. So you're breathing okay, you can breathe the air in, but it doesn't exchange. So you have an oxygenation problem. Now, how do we deal with that? Well, we provide patients with oxygen. 
we put a cannula in the nose or we put a helmet on, we give them high flow oxygen to give them enough oxygen so that they, even though they're having difficulty exchanging oxygen, the more oxygen we give them, the more they will be able to exchange. And in a large proportion of these patients, they get better. In a small proportion of those patients, they get really sick and they need ventilation. Now we have to mechanically ventilate them. That means we have to mechanically breathe for them and ensure that they get large amounts of oxygen into their blood, into their lungs, so that they can oxygenate. Dexamethasone is a corticosteroid. It is something that suppresses the body's immune response. We use it for a wide range of conditions. I personally have experience in using it for raised intracranial pressure. So what happens is when you have meningitis, you get a bit of an immune response, the pressure in your brain goes up, in your, in your skull goes up, and you want to suppress that immune response. And so you put a patient on dexamethasone and you release that pressure. Well, it's superbly. It's a cheap drug, well-known. We've used it for many things. In this particular instance, dexamethasone, when the study that was undertaken by researchers at Oxford University in the study called the recovery trial, they showed that if you give patients on ventilators this drug dexamethasone and suppress that immune response, then you can reduce the number of deaths by about a third. It also helps in patients who are just on oxygen, not on ventilators, but on oxygen. And it reduces those deaths by about a fifth. It has no benefit to a patient with the coronavirus who's not on ventilation, not on oxygen, no benefit. In fact, it could even be harmful. So it is not a drug to take if you get the coronavirus infection. The drug has to be administered because it can be taken in injection form in the, in the IV drip or as tablets, but it's administered only to patients who have severe coronavirus infection. That is, they are on oxygen or they are on ventilation. That was the part that I was getting to because I think some of the public probably thought that this was a preventative measure and what you'd explain now that this is not a preventative measure, but rather a measure to put in place in certain cases only and not all cases. So I think that clears uh, that, that matter up. Prof, the lockdown. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the show. Yeah, the lockdown. Some people are, are, are still in lockdown. Some, some people perhaps remain in lockdown. Others refuse to comply. And then there's people that are saying that the lockdown was a waste of time. We had 150,000 at the moment, so we wasted our time in the lockdown. How do you respond to that? So when we look at what situation we were faced with, on the 5th of March, we had our first case. We knew based on the information we had from China at the time and from Italy and just starting in New York, that this virus spreads rapidly. And before you know it, your hospitals get overwhelmed because the virus spreads so quickly that it goes from hundreds infected to thousands, to tens of thousands, to hundreds of thousands very quickly in a matter of days. And, and so this rapid growth of the number of infected individuals presents a problem in that because the hospitals get overwhelmed, patients can't get in, they can't get medical care and they start dying. And so we wanted to avoid that situation. So what were our options? This is back in March when there's very limited information. Correct. We saw the one country that had managed to contain the virus was China. And the way it did so was using a lockdown. Now, you can call it whatever you like. In Europe, they call it stay at home order. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in China, it's more military, so it's given a military term, lockdown. In the US, it's called stay at home. So there's different ways of, of, of calling it. But essentially, we had to make a decision. Do, you, do we allow this virus to spread? Because remember, the virus 
has no way to move by itself. It cannot move. It, it, it cannot breathe. It cannot do anything. It's just uh, you know, viruses are barely living. So it has no way to move. It depends on humans to move. So as humans move, the virus moves. So if we restrict the movement of humans, we restrict the movement of the virus. So that decision was informed with limited information, but it was informed by the need for us to reduce and limit the flow of people. Because if we had lots of people mingling with each other, virus will spread. Well, we now, with hindsight, right, because we're now 14, 15 weeks later, we have better information. And we can see that it is without question that the lockdown in South Africa had the net effect of flattening the curve. We would have been in where we are today with about 150,000 cases. We would have been in this situation in about April. Now think about it, being in this situation of 150,000 cases and rapidly increasing, having this in April, before we were even ready to deal with it, would have been a major concern. Instead, in the time that we've gained, we've built field hospitals, we've increased the number of ventilators, we've secured additional supplies of oxygen, we've done so many things to try and contain this, 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 this virus. And that is uh, the net effect that that will have is that it will firstly decrease the number of cases, we think, and most importantly, it will enable people to get medical care when they need it. Now, I think no country will ever have enough medical care for this, this virus just because of the way it grows. But we are now in a much better position, not just that we've you know, enhanced and built up and supported the healthcare uh, services, but also in the time that's happened, there've been new discoveries. We now have more technologies for diagnosis. We have new prophylactics and new treatments like remdesivir and you just discussed dexamethasone. So we are now in a much better place to deal with the large numbers of people that are going to come into our hospitals. And so the lockdown has had many benefits for us as a nation and us as a country. There are prices that we have paid for that lockdown. Right. Time and history will determine whether that price that we paid was worth it. The one thing I noticed was that I think that people didn't realize that in this time that we live in, all of us today, I didn't think that we had experienced what we're experiencing right now for all of us walking the planet right now. So I know that people like yourself have some type of formula that's going on, but when we start experiencing something, you are reacting to that and building knowledge based on what is happening at the time. But it wasn't written somewhere <laughs> 10 years ago to say it's happening on this date and time. Are you guys ready with the cannons on standby? Only a certain amount of that could have been done. But you're remodeling all the time. And for some reason, the public doesn't always understand that you're remodeling as you're using data today to move on tomorrow. Because where's the da where does the data need to come from? In the 1990s, early 1990s, under the apartheid government, I was asked to join the national advisory group on immunization for our government. In fact, I chaired it for quite a while. And uh, the National Advisory Group on Immunization, which still exists today, when we created it in the 1990s, one of the first tasks we set out to do was to prepare for a flu pandemic. We had, based on the cyclical nature of flu, we anticipated there would be a flu pandemic somewhere around 94, 95, 96, somewhere in that sort of area. So we started preparing for that. We did detailed plans and so on. And I was very much part of that together with my colleagues. 
uh, led by Professor Barry Shub of the National Institute of Virology. So South Africa has, uh, had at least, I'm not sure it still has, but has pandemic flu preparedness plans. And I chaired our government's polio expert committee that led to the elimination of polio in South Africa. So I've been doing this for a long time, but I can tell you nothing, nothing has prepared me for this coronavirus. Differently altogether. I, in, in the ministerial advisory committee, I talk about it that we are building the ship as we are sailing it. Because nobody sat down and said, here's our grand plan about how we're going to deal with this virus. We, we didn't even know much about this virus. Just, just last week, I learned that this virus can actually cause diabetes. I mean, would you have thought this virus causes diabetes? Mm -hmm. Well, last week, several papers came out, this virus can cause diabetes. So we learn new things all the time. And as we learn them, we use that information to the best of our ability to fine tune what we're doing and to revise what we are doing because we are learning as we go along. A lot of parents has been concerned about their kids going back to school. So there's been usually, I mean, if you recall the back to school thing, when we were in school, it really meant something else. Now back to school really means something else altogether. Lots of contention, lots of issues, parents saying, are oh, you putting my child at risk? Why is government pushing uh, uh, the schools to be reopened? All that type of thing. Uh, what's your thoughts around schools opening? We know that children have a lower susceptibility to this virus. And when they do acquire the infection, they have mostly a very mild course, or in some cases, you know, an asymptomatic course. Uh, and that severe forms of this disease in children is quite rare. We also have to think about the fact that we're going to have to learn to live with this virus for quite a while. This virus is not going away anytime soon, and we're not going to get a vaccine you know, in the immediate future. It's going to take time to develop one. So that means that for the next several months, if not years, we have to find a way to continue with our lives, going to school, going to work, and so on. We can do so. If we do so with the required precautions and protocols, we can reduce and mitigate that risk. But for children going to school, we have some basic protocols that, if followed, really should mitigate that risk. So. There is no good reason why children shouldn't feel uh, sufficiently safe to go to school. We uh, know that if you keep your social distancing, you ensure you, you know, hand sanitize and that you maintain your face mask, it should be perfectly, uh, in, in, in the, the risk should be under perfectly good control so that it's not an undue risk that the children face. I think generally people assume that children could be the carriers, for example. Is that correct? In a way, for example, they, they could go from household A, uh, where the virus may be prevalent, um, then carry it but not show any symptoms at all, go to school, pass it on to child B, and uh, go into household C with that, where there might be an elderly living in that house with some type of comorbid factors like diabetes. Isn't that a real possibility? So we understand that children can be vectors of the virus in certain diseases. Influenza being a classic case of that. That children acquire influenza and then take it back home and they spread it. In the coronavirus, it's a different situation. Uh, studies done in Germany and other places have shown that children are actually seldom the sources of infection in households. And in one study, only 8% of household transmission was due to a child bringing the virus in. So it does occur, but it's not a common occurrence. And we, uh, you know, back in Easter Monday, when I 
shared with the nation the challenges of dealing with this virus, I did explain that the elderly, those above the age of 60, 65, need to consider how best they want to mitigate their risk because they are at a much higher risk of a severe form of the disease. And the way in which you know, they want to implement their own protection, including whether they want to go into some kind of self-imposed stay-at-home order. And uh, many of the elderly people do that as it stands. And I think that that's reasonable. Children should avoid interacting with their grandparents when they get home. And if we take that approach, we can mitigate that risk. Of course. Having said all of that, it must be pointed out that the president made it very clear in his speech that no parent should be forced to send their child to school. If a parent feels that that level of risk that's associated with going to school is too high, then they need to keep that child at home by their own volition. The school is open, but if they prefer to homeschool the child, they can do so. Of course. There's also a very fundamental issue that when children are at home, if you can keep you know, a 10-year-old isolated in that child's house and prevent them from playing with the other kids in the street, good luck, because in reality, children mingle, they play with each other and they do all kinds of things. Their risk of getting this virus is far higher outside of school than it is inside of school. Thank you for shedding some light on that because that was something that, that parents really wanted to, to know and understand. The virus itself, one of the, 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 the common questions, if one had the coronavirus, can you get it again? Or does the system build up some immunity like some diseases where you won't get it again in your life or maybe the chances are slimmer? Can you get the coronavirus again? We know for some viral diseases, in fact for most, that when you get it once, you don't get it again. If you get measles once, the antibodies you, you will make will protect you from ever getting measles again. Good. So that we know as a fact for several diseases. In the coronavirus, we have no idea if that's true. We do not yet know whether somebody who acquired this virus previously, who's developed antibodies, and whether those antibodies will protect them if they became exposed again a second time. We don't know if they will be protected by their first infection and the antibodies from their first infection. And even if they were protected, we have no idea how long that protection will be valid for. So that's a big unanswered question in the coronavirus. And so, so those people tell me, you know, we need to head for herd immunity. Well, I said, we don't even know if the first infection protects you from the next infection. What herd immunity are you talking about? We don't even know if it exists for this, this disease with natural infection. So right now, we have many unanswered questions. Just for remember that we've only known about this virus for just over six months. So we will now wait for those countries that have already had their first wave, China, Italy, and so on. And we'll wait for them to get their second wave. And when they get their second wave, we will have to see whether those who became infected in the first wave become infected now again. And that will tell us that answer. But we have a long way to wait for that because we have to wait now for those countries to have a second wave. And they're doing everything possible to avoid a second wave. Great. So, uh, you know, that's the challenge we face in science. How managed is statistics when it... I just want to... I have a scenario in my head and perhaps I can just lay that out for you. People become COVID positive. Uh, they, they can pass on. Uh, they can recover or they, they've been to the doctor, for example 
and the doctor says you're COVID positive, go home, self-isolate, and then they recover and whatever it might be. With all that, would that indicate a, an accurate measure? Or do you believe that the stat that we're looking at today is perhaps way higher in reality than what we're actually looking at around 150,000? Yeah, so you can get some idea of what our underreporting is because we have some idea that there's a certain proportion of people who get this virus who never have symptoms. So they, they don't even know they have the disease. And we don't know what fraction that is for sure, but we think it's possibly somewhere around a third or a fifth. Uh, perhaps even more, maybe up to half of all the infections are you know, asymptomatic. So we can make some estimations of what that is. A very simple way to make that estimation is you look at the deaths. We know that roughly about 1% of patients who are cases will die. Roughly, based on the experiences of the whole world, we're now having you know, about 10 million cases or so. so if you take the number of deaths we have today, multiply it by 100, because 1% died, so 99% survived, that tells you how many cases there were likely to be. And there's some variation within that, but it's a reasonable estimate, about a week or two ago. So if you work with, say, 10 days, so 10 days ago, that's how many cases we had. The number of deaths today multiplied by 100. 10 days previously, that's roughly how many cases we had. And you can compare that to the number that was officially announced. So you can get some idea of what the difference is. In South Africa, we roughly uh, undercount somewhere between a third of the cases to about half the cases uh, are not included in the cases in all likelihood. Uh, and those are cases that just they weren't symptomatic and so or they were very mildly symptomatic and so they just didn't get counted. And that that's true pretty much all over the world that there's this difference that we can see between the count and what the likely total number of infections is. So some countries have tried to measure that. Uh, Geneva is an example of that. In Switzerland, they did an, uh, a big survey of antibodies to look at how many people actually have been exposed. And they come up with similar kinds of numbers, between a third and a f uh, somewhere between a third and half of all the cases are just never identified. So we can work with that. It doesn't matter too much in terms of how we look at the epidemic and how it's growing, because our, uh, the number of cases we have, that same bias applies throughout. So the trends are still useful, even if the absolute number is an undercount. Masks. There's a debate going on. Masks or, not, or, or don't wear the masks. So some people are saying, no, the mask is doing this and doing that, and it's part of the, some are saying it's part of the conspiracies and all of that. So let's leave the conspiracy part of it out of it. The mask, does it play a role and what role does it play? Initially, some uh, lack of clarity about whether masks really helped or not. And the World Health Organization was initially hesitant. And the main reason for that is that in the masks, uh, the virus is so small that it can get through the holes in the material of the mask. And so there was some concern about whether that would really help or not. Now the evidence has accumulated sufficiently that the World Health Organization now recommends wearing a mask. And the reason for that is that when somebody has the virus, a mask is really helpful in containing the spread from that person. And the problem is that there are so many people who have the virus and they are able to put out, you know, when they just, when they're talking or singing or uh, coughing, 
they put out these little droplets and the virus is in those droplets. And when they have a mask, they then contain those droplets. They don't allow those droplets to go and contaminate the whole surface. Now we understand that it is pretty much accepted everywhere now. The science is pretty compelling that masks actually assist in slowing the spread of the virus. And in South Africa, together with social distancing and hand washing, we regard mask wearing as one of the three mainstays of our approach to mitigating the risk of this disease. So there's no doubt at this stage that masks are of benefit. I just want to leave all the stats aside and ask you this question, and I'm asking you this question. <laughs> the world has changed forever in my view. It's my, it's my opinion that, that the world has changed forever. This pandemic has left an indelible mark in time like many has previously and maybe at some point we come back as human beings and we, we continue with life uh, again i'm not certain about that but how do you see the world just going forward in the next couple of months how do you see that change i personally used to be one that travels all the time i used to be up and down everywhere that's changed for me so my world has changed and and certainly everyone's world has changed i, have, I would have never sat in the study of my home doing the show with you right now. I would have preferred having you in the studio, like you were many years ago when you came to the studio to see us. So the world has changed for everybody. Do you see that change on a broader scale and how do you see that, that change itself? There is no question that the world has changed. Not only for us, it has changed for everyone. There are certain things that we would take for granted. Hugging, shaking hands, the human touch, the, the, the feeling of warmth that we get from each other, the support that we get from each other by touching. That is something of the past. Our lives as we knew it, on the 4th of March of this year, is no more. Even if the coronavirus doesn't really, if we can you know, get a vaccine or whatever against the coronavirus, we as a species, the human beings that we are, we will carry a risk of getting viruses from animals. And that is going to continue for many years. Remember, the bats have millions of these coronaviruses. So far, three of these bat coronaviruses have jumped into humans. Started off with SARS back in 2002. From bats, it went to civets, from civets into humans caused a severe acute respiratory distress. Fortunately, it didn't spread too fast and didn't spread very well. And so the Chinese were able to contain it. Then we had MERS from bats into camels, from camels into humans. MERS was a much more deadly disease. 40, 50% of people who got infected with MERS died. And now we have SARS coronavirus 2. It's going to be SARS coronavirus 3, 4. They're all coming. We, we can't avoid that problem because we now have intervened and taken over parts of the habitat that the bats have lived in. We now interact with wild animals much more than we did before. We are invading their space. We are coming into the forest, we're chopping them down and so on, and we are interfering in their environment. So when we do that, the consequences of that is we run the risk of acquiring the viruses and the bacteria that they have. So even if once we've dealt with this coronavirus, humankind, is going to face the prospect 
of dealing with many others. Just yesterday, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, there was an article about swine flu. Flu, an influenza virus that's widely prevalent in pigs, and its potential to cause a pandemic. Something we're really scared about, actually, an influenza pandemic, because it can lead to millions of deaths. And so these threats that we have are going to become more frequent, and we, as humankind, need to be prepared to protect ourselves from those infections and those pandemics. We can do so. We have the ingenuity, we have the technology, we have the ability to do that. But we also have to change our behavior. We can't only depend on technology, just like with this coronavirus. We have to change our behavior. And that means we're going to have to live for what people call the new normal, the new way in which you and I are talking through Zoom instead of sitting across the table, the way in which we will interact with our families, the way we interact with our friends. I can't wait to, to you know, start visiting my aunts and uncles and so on. So because it's something we, we would do. It's just how we were, you know, that's in our DNA. And so we feel deprived that we aren't able to appreciate that human interaction. But it's a thing of the past. We have to find a way to live this new normal and adapt to the changing needs of our society and our world. Prof, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, some very extensive information. And I know that months down the line, I'm going to catch up with you again. And you're probably going to tell me all that I told you in the first interview. Can we ignore that and, and move on to the next one? So thank you for your time. Only a pleasure. Lovely. Good seeing you. Well, that's Professor Salim Abdul Karim giving us his perspective, perceptions, research and data on where we're at with COVID-19 and coronavirus. I'm hoping to have him soon back on the show. I know that there are some issues pertaining to people that are saying a lot of things. Social media is a buzz, Facebook is a buzz. People are contacting the show and saying that, well, uh, this, that and the other, and I know this and that theory and the other. The issue right now is that we are cluttering the space. We are making lots of noise. We need to speak from an evidence-based perspective. Our knowledge needs to be evidence-based before we put that out in the public space. When we are on social media, we need to think twice before we put information out, before we share YouTube videos, and before we put anything out there that might confuse the public in a very confusing space already. Mm -hmm.